Before we start treatment for any of my patients, I consider myself their detective. Number one, what's the issue? Number two, is it fixable? And then number three, what are the next steps to reach their goals? In four simple tests as your reproductive endocrinologist, I can determine the main causes of lack of conception to date and what the right treatment steps are for you. So the exams that are done at the beginning of treatment can be broken down into four simple tests. First and foremost, I'll recommend a blood test for my patients, specifically to look at ovarian reserve. There's a few different blood hormones that can be run on a patient, but the one that's most reliable, the one that's most dependable, it doesn't fluctuate a whole lot month to month to month, is a hormone level called your AMH or your anti-malarian hormone. And this, interestingly, is a hormone that's actually made by the ovary. And it doesn't matter where you are in your cycle, so even if you don't have a cycle, it can still be reliable. And it really lets me know, as a reproductive endocrinologist, a patient's resting egg count. One of the other times that we do hormone testing that's specific to the menstrual cycle is day three of a woman's menstrual period, if she gets a regular period. It's a great time to evaluate a hormone called follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH, that's actually produced by our anterior pituitaries in our brain. And basically, it's the signal to get the ovary to make an egg. Depending on how high or low that hormone level is, it's really representative of a patient's resting egg count as well. So many of my patients don't get regular menstrual periods at all, and it's super confusing. When's their day three? Is day 21 okay? Is day 465 okay? It doesn't mean you can't get this testing, we just need to give you individualized guidance. So the HSG stands for hysterosalpingogram, and it's an x-ray dye study test of the uterine lining as well as the fallopian tubes. Full disclosure, it's a little crampy, so I encourage my patients to pre-medicate before the examination. Typically, ibuprofen or Tylenol is a good choice, but it really helps me to understand the internal contour of the uterine lining. Is there something pushing on the uterine lining, preventing implantation? Is the uterus a normal shape or size? And most importantly, are the fallopian tubes open and allowing for passage of sperm and eggs? Many of my patients uh, find that they have blocked tubes at the time of an HSG, and initially this can be very upsetting. For many women that have blocked tubes, particularly if they're blocked tubes on both sides, we'll talk about fertility treatments that actually circumnavigate the fallopian tubes. The most common one is in vitro fertilization. Ultrasound is a great way to be able to visualize our internal pelvic structures, specifically to measure the shape and size of our ovaries. It's a great time to look for ovarian cysts that can kind of play goalie uh, for affecting the ability for the fallopian tube to pick up an egg. And it's a great time to actually measure the shape and size of the uterus to be certain that it's normal and there are no abnormal structures such as an endometrial polyp or a uterine fibroid. I look after many women who are diagnosed with uterine fibroids. It's a very common condition. The great news is that it's benign. However, um, oftentimes, depending on the position, location, and size of a uterine fibroid, it can affect fertility and a woman's ability to conceive or to actually carry a pregnancy. So depending on their size and shape, we'll characterize them. And I'll give my patients guidance about the need for removal or if they're just in a place where I kind of call them innocent bystanders. We can observe, we can watch, and we can make certain they're not changing size and shape as treatment progresses. I talk to all of my patients who have male partners about having a semen analysis. And I kind of joke that, you know, it's not romantic. We get it. Um, there's nothing romantic, and it's a little embarrassing to give us an ejaculated sperm specimen in a plastic cup, but it's so informative. We look at several different parameters of a semen analysis. I'll look at the volume of ejaculate. That's really important. And then I'll look at the actual count or concentration. It's measured in millions of sperm that the male patient has. We want to make sure that the sperm is moving briskly, is swimming briskly. We call that motility. So we'll actually measure which ones are moving briskly. We want at least half of the specimen to be swimming quickly. And then last but not least, we look at one final parameter. We call this morphology. So we actually measure the shapes of the heads and the tails of the sperm and we give it a score based on a standard assessment called the Kruger Strict Scale to see how many of them are normal shapes and sizes. 
home testing can be a really helpful springboard for patients to determine if they want to seek care sooner. Um, but home testing also has its limitations. Um, so I love some of the things that are available to our patients right now, like the digital apps to track menstrual periods or ovulation predictor kits that are available at drugstores. There are even some home mail-away semen analysis kits. Um, and they can be really helpful as a starting point, um, but, but really you need someone who's a reproductive endocrinologist to put all of the data together for you to understand, number one, is it something that we need to fix? And number two, what are the treatment options that are available based on the results of the testing? I encourage every patient to have a follow-up visit where I actually make a summary sheet for them uh, and I collect all of this data and I present it back. I encourage people to take screenshots of this to keep it for their home medical records. It's yours and it's really important that you uh, understand the different numbers that were gained. Um, but from that analysis, that really helps me to understand what treatment options are open to patients and then I walk them through the likelihood of success with each and every treatment option. But those treatment options are very individualized, taking into account the results of the testing that we've done and the patient's clinical scenario. These things are very important, but ultimately at the end of the day, it's up to the patient or the couple to decide what feels right for them. Um, and, and I support whatever they want to do, but objective data is really important so they can make an informed decision.